Hi, and welcome to Widow Too Soon. This is Michelle Bader Eversole. I'm not here with Mark like I usually am. Like I always say, I'm sitting here with Mark Massaro, but um, he was in, unable to be here today. But I'm excited because we have a completely different type of episode. You know, normally our guests are widows, um, but today we have someone that I believe is really going to help us all with her expertise. So I am sitting with Ann Garcia, who is a certified financial advisor. How are you today, Ann? I'm well. How are you? Good. Thanks for being here. So Ann and I just discovered that she's in Portland, Oregon, and I'm in Ridgeville, Washington. We're like 30 minutes away, like had no idea. Um, so Ann is here to talk to us about all things finances. So I'm really excited. Um, she gave me a copy of her book, which I just started, haven't finished, but I'm going to. And it's, um, tell me the name again. Oh, How to Pay for College, right? Is that the name of it? Yep. Yeah. And uh, that really piqued my curiosity because as you guys know, my daughter is heading to college soon. She is accepted at Corbin University, um, which is in Salem, Oregon, and she's really excited, but it's very expensive, <laughs> very. And right now we don't know exactly how we're going to pay for all of that. Um, she doesn't want to pay anything. She went through financial peace for teens or something at school. And she learned that she never wants to, like, she doesn't want to like take out loans and do all this stuff. So she's working hard on scholarships. There are a lot of scholarships for people who've lost a parent. In fact, tonight we're finishing it's It's due by the end of February. So we're finishing her application. Um, she's finishing. I'm going to look over it and it's put on by a life insurance company about um, if your parent didn't have life insurance, so you guys know like Luke had cancer since he was 26, so we could not get life insurance. Um, so it's for kids whose parents didn't have it and how it impacted your life. And she didn't really know about life insurance, so I explained that to her and she's like, well, how would life be different? I'm like, we would have paid for college with your life, with the life insurance. So that's a big way it would be different. And anyways, all that to say, like all of this is really, really interesting to me, but I thought we would start with, cause we have widows and widowers of all ages and different places in life but i thought i would talk a little bit about because i've never talked about this on the podcast what life was like for me with finances um right after luke died and then we'll just kind of get into some topics so as you guys know my husband my first husband died three and a half years ago um from cancer if you want to know more you can go to episode two explain the whole thing so he was always the bill guy. Like he actually liked paying bills. Like I remember when we get paid, he'd be like, yes, I can pay bills today. He would do it the old fashioned way, put them in the mail. Like he did not want to do the online stuff. Like he liked it. It was like a job for him, you know? And um, we did go over things. So we knew he was dying. So it was not a sudden death. Like I know a lot of our listeners did have sudden deaths. Um, so he went over, he told me like, where to find everything all his passwords and he's like and just show your dad and your brothers and they'll help you with the bills that's literally like what he told me and you know he died and it was overwhelming already you're dealing with the emotions and then you're dealing with burial plans burial costs like we did not have money and he wanted to be cremated mostly because he said that will cost less <laughs> and that was a big thing for him he wanted it to cost less um thankfully um some friends did a gofundme or a facebook fundraiser and raised all the money um for his burial and more which was great um and then it was just kind of like you know i just learned how to start paying the bills um and i was really proud of myself because i went from not ever paying bills to within 11 months buying a new house. And that was huge for me to learn how to do that and go through the loan process, which was really hard. Um, so it was just a really, really overwhelming time in every single way. And something I remember is that the day, like the first, he died on a Saturday and Monday morning, I had to call, um, he worked for the post office, but he was on disability and I had to call them and tell him he died he had told me you're gonna need to call right away like he had like you know prepared me and i remember it was the first call i had to make my husband died and they had to like they took back the check for the month they're like okay we're gonna do that and then we'll prorate it and it took um like 15 months until i got the prorated amount back so not only did he die and our insurance was gonna get cut off within a month it was like so much at once um you know, I was able to get on state insurance at the time and do all of that. So I don't even know where I'm going with it. I'm just kind of explaining to the listeners like where I was at. And it would have been really nice to have someone like Ann, <laughs> someone like you, a finance, certified financial advisor 
to give me advice. So I guess I kind of want to start with what advice this is kind of broad would you give to someone like I explained to you or you said you do work with widows and widowers like a new widow who's in the midst of like I don't even know where to start with my bills like let's just start basic like what what would you I don't know what would you recommend it's kind of a big question but yeah and <clears throat> excuse me and it's always it's always such a tough question that that we get from people who are in that situation because what we want to tell you is take the time to grieve and don't worry mm. about this but unfortunately the world doesn't <laughs> the world doesn't work that way you know the mortgage needs to get paid and mm -hmm. food needs to show up on the table and and the utilities need to get paid and 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 whatnot i you know i i have found oftentimes this is actually something that you can delegate to one of your friends who wants mm. to help um mm -hmm. and i know that Delegating money seems awful, but your friends will be able to figure out that you have a mortgage, that you have electricity and gas and sewer and water, and, and they can at least take an inventory of those bills and so that, so that you, if you've never looked at this before, can, um, can at least know who needs to get paid and when. Um, you know, it used to be that it was really easy because everything would come by mail. And so right. you would know. Um, now, so often, even if you're paying bills manually, the bills themselves are coming electronically. Mm -hmm. And so so I think it, um, you know, it, when you're in the situation where, like you, you had time to prepare, you know, making sure that you have access to email accounts mm -hmm. and everything else so that you can find all those things is, is really helpful. Likewise, yeah, ahead, yeah. part of preparing ahead of time is, is, you know, if you have retirement savings accounts and whatnot, making sure that, um, you know, making sure that you know where all of those accounts are and, and, and how to access them. Um, and also that they're properly titled with the right beneficiaries because mm. we come across lots of people who maybe started working at a company before they got married started contributing to the 401k and then got married and had kids and never added their spouse as a beneficiary to right their to their 401k or to an old IRA account or or something like that. So um so two different things, you know, things you can do if you're in the situation where you have some time to prepare, you have some advance notice, just make sure that you know where all those things are that one of the yeah, conversations yeah. that you have is where are the bills, how do they get paid? Um, how do I access our bank account? What credit cards do we have? You know, just make sure that you know um, that you know all of those things. I would say another important step, again, if you're in that pre situation, is making sure that you are on all the credit cards. Yes, because we oftentimes um, talk with with widows who don't have any credit in their name. Mm. Um, because everything was in their spouse's name because that's the person who was managing the finances and opening the accounts. And then not only do they not have income, spouse, um, you know, all these other things have been taken away and then they've also lost access to credit or their cards are being closed or, um, or other things. So, so if you have the opportunity to do that inventory ahead of time, it's a really important thing to do. And, and, and it's unfortunate that some of your time and you know some of your last time with with your loved one needs to be spent on that if not you know if you have the option to delegate that to someone that's a great thing to do and and you know chances are if it's somebody who's close by they'll know what all the utilities in your areas in your area are if mm -hmm. not just print out a copy of your bank statement and have um yeah. and then they can see where where that money is um is going and who needs to be paid on an on, on an ongoing basis um yeah, yeah that re that reminds me i did have something like that happen similar it was my my dad and my brothers they came over we got out luke's laptop and we somehow figured out they made a spreadsheet it's all coming back to me now that you're talking about it. they did that for me they got a spreadsheet and here's the bill here's when it's due and they actually did exactly what you're saying so that is very helpful that is something that helped me having someone else do that because I was totally lost <laughs> on when to do that. But yeah, it is tricky too when there are those like automatic payments and then, you know, I had to figure out things like what can I cut out and like 
Luke liked cable TV, like old school, $150 a month, you know, because of the sports. And this was also, this is almost four years ago, which things have changed since then. Now you can stream sports and all that, but then you couldn't. And so we always had the big package. So that was something I cut down right away. Um, I also, he liked the actual physical newspaper me and my kids did not read it. We cut that out. You know, we, we turned yeah. that off. I was like, we don't need that really, you know? And so I would advise looking for things that like you, your spouse use that you don't necessarily need, um, to help you save a little money. Um, and I think too, you know, you, you raise a great point. There are things, there are things that you had as, you know, as partners that you maybe don't want to continue going forward. And, you know, when you're grieving and not wanting to spend a lot of time on stuff, that can be sort of a task that gives you something to focus on that's, you know, lets you lets you take a step back and just mm -hmm. look at it and say, hey, what, it, you know, what are all these subscriptions that we have? What is our right. cable package? And I remember another thing is um, his cell phone. So I know some people like to keep it on for a while, but it does cost money. So I was with AT&T and, you know, we have the contracts, all that stuff, but I brought a death certificate in and they let me close it, no, you know, no penalties. And it was actually in his name. Our account was in his name, but I brought the death certificate. They turned off his phone, closed the account, and then we reopened one without him. I did that pretty soon. Um, Cause I know some people still like to like text them. So what I did instead was send him Facebook messages, you know, so I could still like say things I wanted to say to him, but I didn't have to pay to keep the phone on. So that's an option too, is yeah. um, I'm pretty sure all companies are like that. If you have a death certificate, you can end it early. And then I didn't even know he had credit cards. I mean, I just went through his wallet and we didn't have credit for years, but there were a few credit cards, but they were like, there wasn't really anything on this. It wasn't a big deal, but the, I'm sure that could be a surprise um, mm -hmm. when there's these bills. Do you know what happens if it's just in the person who dies name? Like, does then the it spouse have to pay? Yeah, it depends if you're in a community property state or not. Um, you being in Washington are in a community property state. Mm -hmm. And so assets and liabilities of the marriage are joint are joint assets. Okay, so like if I got to that credit card bill and he owed thousands of dollars, I would have to pay it because we're- Yeah, no, it. you could, of course, go to the credit card company and say, as you know, I don't have mm -hmm. this credit card. <laughs> right. Um, you know, and, and, and you, can, you can try to negotiate with, with creditors in that, in that situation, but, but it is oftentimes, you know, oftentimes it, it is a negotiation. You know, you brought up another point, which was having death certificates and mm -hmm. getting lots of them. Yes, for sure. It's a really good thing to do so that you don't have to keep going back and, and getting more. You know, it's just as easy to get 25 of them up front as yep. to get five of them up front. Um, yes. And, and you'll be surprised at the number of places that you, that you need yes. to use. Yes. Um, putting his truck in my name, I needed the death certificate. Closing his bank account needed the death certificate. There's just so many things. Um, even some of these scholarships Haley's applying for, you need a death certificate, you know, to prove that mm -hmm. you really had a parent that died. So it's very important. I had um, a widow tell me these things before Luke died. She had like a list, a checklist. I should find it somewhere. And it was like 10 things every widow should know. And it was get a lot of death certificates. I would have never known that before. It would, you know, birth certificate, you just need one. <laughs> but death certificate, it seems like you need a lot of those. And just on the emotional side of it, that was really hard getting the death certificate. When you, you see your spouse's name on mm -hmm. a death certificate, it was crazy. Um, Anyways, that's just a side note that I know a lot of our listeners have probably been through that. That that is like a really weird time. And I have this folder and I have all our birth certificates, death certificate, his death certificate. It's weird because I have his birth certificate and I have his death certificate. And it's just a strange, like surreal feeling um, to see your spouse's name on that. And anyways, OK, moving on to finances again. Um, so something I before we get into the big one, I'm really excited, which is the college. I want to talk about um, retirement, which I also don't really know a lot about. So what would you say is the biggest advice for saving for retirement and planning ahead? I think the sooner you start, the more work your money does. The later you start, the more work you do. So even if you're even if you're saving very small amounts as as a younger person, those are going to be worth so so much to you at at a future point. And um, there, you know, 
in anyone's life, there, there are life, life goes in ebbs and flows, um, mm-hmm. no, no matter what. And, and so when you have the opportunity to do more saving, you are buying yourself future flexibility by, mm. by doing that. And so, you know, if you have a life insurance benefit that you've received, you know, getting a lot of that into retirement, into long-term savings is going to be really beneficial. Now, of course, you have that life insurance benefit because you need to replace income mm-hmm. and, um, and earning power of your spouse. So, so certainly don't feel like that's the, you know, that's the only thing to, to, to do with it. But whenever you have the opportunity to save, doing so just buys you flexibility for points for later points in your life, whether it's saving for retirement, saving for college, saving for just having an emergency savings account. Mm-hmm. Um, any, any of those is going to buy you future flexibility. And the sooner you do it, the more opportunity your money has to compound and, and grow. And so I think, you know, choosing the easy options is usually the easiest way to do it. So if your employer has a retirement savings plan at work, that's usually the best way to save because that money mm-hmm. just comes out of your paycheck and you don't, you don't really see it. That's a lot easier than you know, taking money out of your bank account and transferring it to Vanguard to put in your Roth IRA. Um, right. That, you know, the other thing is that um, your spouse's retirement accounts will become yours and you have two options with it, uh, with, um, with your spouse's retirement accounts as, as a widow. One is to roll them into your own IRA and then that just becomes your retirement savings. The other is to um, roll them in, roll it into what's called an inherited IRA. And there are slightly different rules about both of those. With one of the benefits of having some money in an inherited IRA is that you can take it out before you're 59 and a half without paying penalties. Okay. Um, there are some other restrictions to how it gets used, um, but but um, but but it can be beneficial to have some of the savings be be that way so that you have that, that option of, of accessing them, them earlier. Okay, so I'm really confused on a lot of things. Like, I know nothing about this stuff. So with Luke, we, I thought, okay, no, that's not it. So he, ha- we get social security, you know, mm-hmm. for my kids do. I'm married again, so I don't get it, but my two kids that are under 18 are still receiving it. And, you know, mm-hmm. it goes to my bank account for them. Um, so that's from when he, that's his social security from when he worked and there's another account like he should have, I mean, I know I'm serious. I'm really bad at finances, but there might be other people listening that are like, I don't know what you're talking. So then he, all this stuff? and then he was on disability for like 15 years. I don't know, 12 mm-hmm. years, long time. Like, yeah. but he also called that his retirement. Like, so I'm confused if there's like another account somewhere that would have his retirement. Can you explain yeah. that? Sure, so so there's various ways that you can save for retirement. A lot of them are tied to your job. So most employers, particularly larger ones, offer some form of retirement savings plan right. that you can opt into. So that might be a 401k or a 403b or a 457. Um, those are, you know, ones that typically bigger employer ha- employers have. Smaller employers have accounts like Simple IRAs or SEPs or, um, or, or accounts like that. And those are, those are accounts that you make voluntary contributions from your payroll mm. into. Um, now, some entities, um, you know, government employers, some private employers also have pensions. Um, and so it's possible that he had a pension through the Postal Service, because I think you mentioned Postal Service. Mm-hmm, he did As well, him. it's also possible that the disability benefit ate, ate that all up. I think that's what it is, because I had a friend, like, um, and her husband helped me. Like, we did, we sent something into the post office because we thought there might be something. I can't even remember what it was now, but he didn't have it. So I think it was, yeah, I don't know which thing it was. But I thought there was like this extra thing and then we didn't have it. And I don't know if that's because, yeah, he was on disability. And so that that makes sense. That's probably what it was. Um, yeah. And that took what would have been the retirement. Okay. Yeah. No, I, and, I, you know, another thing you can do is you can do a social security number search for oh. lost assets. Oh, how do you do that? 
Um, <laughs> so every state has their own database of, um, of lost assets. So if you just Google lost assets okay. um, database, and you can typically search by social security number, and then you can find if there are savings accounts out there wow. that were you know, that were your husband's that, that you would be, that you would be entitled to. That's huge. That tip right there might help so many people. I've never yeah. heard of that social security yeah. search. And I mean, we come across this from people, you know, who, you know, who are still here that they've just lost track of savings accounts that they, um, that they have, but there's, um, but, but there's, you know, there is unclaimed property out there and, you know, oftentimes it's, what was a small IRA, which is an individual retirement account. So that's a retirement savings account that you would set up outside of your employer and contribute, contribute your own, your own money to. Um, but you know, if you set up an account like that 20 years ago and, you know, even put a thousand dollars in it, it could be worth quite a bit. Right. And here's the other thing I've been thinking, thinking about is, um, I've worked for several public schools and I'm like telling Joel, my new husband, I'm like, I'm sure I have something somewhere. I know there was like retired, there was something like, I don't even know how to find it. Would that be this, that, or maybe just contacting well, the districts? I would contact the district. Okay. Because I do remember I did get a letter. You know all the places that you've worked so you can go right. back there and find out what benefits you're entitled to. And, and, um, you know, and if they're all public schools in Washington, then you're a member of the Washington retirement system. Right. I remember that name. <laughs> like, um, sorry, I, I mean, this is so good for me. I'm learning so much about this because Joel and I have been talking about retirement a lot more lately because we don't have anything like set up. So, cause we're both self-employed right now and you know, that's a whole other thing. But, um, I remember when Luke died, I did get a letter from one of these places because they knew that Luke died somehow. It said, well, you need to choose a new beneficiary. And I never did. So <laughs> I know I need to do that. Anyway, I think it's because none of my kids were over 18 at the time, but now I have mm -hmm. about to be two over 18. So that's something I should probably look back into, but somehow they were alerted that my beneficiary was gone. So that's what yeah. clues me in that I have something somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm a yeah, part of of estate plan. You do have money, you know, you do have, have money somewhere. Um, and, and yeah, what happens? So with, with retirement accounts, you name, a primary beneficiary, and then you can also name contingent beneficiaries. And with an employer account, you do name your spouse as your as your beneficiary if you open it up when um, when you're married. Um, and you can choose to name your children as contingent beneficiaries. Now, there's no requirement that you go and change it as long as you're okay with those contingent beneficiaries now being your primary beneficiaries. Right. But I think mine probably has nothing because it was before the kids were born. So I yeah. definitely actually need to put Joel, my new husband on it. And then the kids as the contingent. So I just yeah. learned some more. Thank you. <laughs> and I really, <laughs> and the really important thing I know a lot of people ask, they're like, Oh, well, I have a will. I've got this all taken care of in my will. That is completely separate from when you have retirement accounts, insurance policies, mm. anything like that, that, that you name a beneficiary on, that is the beneficiary of that account, regardless of what, of what oh. your will says. So this is really important for people who are in second marriages Yes, to make sure that these are, all these things are, are up to date and have, you know, current spouses listed as, as beneficiaries. Right. Right. We've even, Joel and I've been talking about, like, I need to get him on so we, he moved into my house here in Washington, need to get his name. Well, and I need to change it because I changed my last name. We need to get the current right names on the property because I've heard like awful stories from widows who weren't on the property, like just all kinds of things, mm -hmm. you know, and then he's has a house in Louisiana and that's a, they have weird rules in Louisiana. Um, with like it goes like partly to the kids partly to me like this whole different thing I don't know if you know what I'm talking about somebody mm -hmm. told me about it um so we need to get my name on his house there and just like all these things we haven't I'm like I don't like to think about it. obviously I've already been widowed but things happen and so we need to get all of this stuff taken care of for our second marriage and yeah. you know and that's part I know we have listeners who are married again or they're planning to get married again so this is great information too if you're looking at another you know marriage yeah. And, you know, and just so you know, if you, if you have a will, you can name who gets all the stuff like your house, your car, your, your personal property. Um, 
and, and, and those types of things. If you don't have a will, then they just get distributed however the state says, right. whatever the state's rules of um, intestate succession, it's called, are. Um, and so that's kind of a pain in the neck. I mean, if you're, if you're the spouse, you're going to get the assets, but you've got enough to do with grief and with holding your family together and keeping your head above water. Don't complicate your life by not, by not having proper beneficiaries and, and not, not doing a will. It's easy to do, you know, it's easy to do an online will. It's depressing. It's, um, yeah. It's all those things, but um, but think of that as you know as an investment in your in your relationship and as something that you're that you're doing for, you know, for your partner and for your right. children. Right. Yeah, we did Luke's like a month before he died, and I've never had to use it for anything. I've never had to show it because we are a community state or whatever community property. But I wanted it just in case, like in mm -hmm. case I need it for anything. But I need to do one. But I guess probably a lot of people listening, I I get scared to do it. Like I don't. It's hard because, you know, he did it and he died. And, like, it's just a really hard thing for me to do. But I know for my kids I should mm -hmm. do it. So I'm speaking to all of you out there who are widowed. We need to do this. And I'll, I'll be accountable and come back and tell you when I did it. Um, we need to do this for our kids, um, especially if they don't have another parent. Um, they, we, you know, would need to put where, where they would go and what we would want for them and all of that. So I hate thinking about it, but I know it needs to be done. And, and especially if you're if you're remarried, because you probably have things that you want to be your children's property, you know, True. things that are mementos from their dad and whatnot. Yeah. And, and if you don't have a will, that's not where they're going to go. Mm, good point. Oh, this stuff is hard, but it's so good. Like we need to think about it. So great yeah, information. So think of it as something that you're doing for your kids and for your partner. Right. And hopefully that gets you gets you over the hump. <laughs> right. Yes. Um, yeah, it's, it's the, <clears throat> one of the most unpleasant things. Yeah, I know it was hard for Luke. Like, uh, we just went on and did one of the, I can't remember. What's the one online that everybody does? Docu, no, no, not the docu thing. Uh, uh, I don't know. We went online, did one, a cheap will, and then I had people, it was during COVID, so we had to stand outside and sign it and, like, <laughs> distance ourselves and sign it. But I had the uh, notary and the witness and all that stuff do it. Um, but it made me feel better knowing I had it just in case there were any issues with anything. Um, and online wills are great when you have a very straightforward family situation. Um, when you get into situations like second marriages, you know, both of you bringing kids into the marriage, it can really be beneficial to, um, to do a will with an, with an attorney just so you make sure that, that everyone's rights are, are protected as they, as they should be. Um, That's good advice. And, and that you have a will that won't be contested. You know, if your new husband gives you something that's a family heirloom and he passes away, mm. do his siblings expect to get it back? Um, right. That's, you know, that's all the kind of the stuff where you really want to have an, an airtight will when it's, you know, first marriage and their kids and, you know, not not complex assets that you're trying to, to avoid, the, you know, to... Mm -hmm. pass on through complex ways, then, um, then the online wills are great. Yeah, that's good. Well, I am excited to move on to the next subject, and that's about college, since this is a big one to me and I know to a lot of our listeners. Um, so I guess what, what can you tell us about your book, um, How to Save for College, and like your biggest tips? I know there's so much in the book, we don't have time to go through all of it, but what are your <laughs> biggest tips for how to pay for college and how to, you know, all of that stuff? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think the, the most, the most important thing for, for families to know is that college is available at every price point. You know, we let so much of the college narrative be driven by the Harvards and Stanfords of the world <laughs> where it's, you know, $85,000 a year and you should be grateful that you're able to, to come here. But truly you can get a four-year college degree at, at any, at any price point. My, um, I have twins who just graduated from college oh. last year. Um, my son has a friend who got her degree for zero dollars. Um, wow. She did two years of free community college, and then she was working at Starbucks. And Starbucks has a tuition partnership program with oh. Arizona State. So she finished her degree there. You know, she, her family wasn't able to support her financially through college, and she knew she needed a degree for her, um, you know, for, for the career goals that she had. 
and and she was able to do it and there's really everything everything in between so um so i know that when you um you know when you're in a challenging financial situation there probably isn't a lot of extra money out there for college and you will have good college choices um at you know really at 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 every price point. Um, there's been plenty of research that's been done about the value of a college degree and doesn't matter where you go to college. And, and the consistent conclusion has been, you know, getting the benefits of college is more about how you go to college than where you go to college. Mm. You know, that you participate in the college, that you, um, that you find mentors and, and role models there, that you have opportunities to apply classroom learning outside of the classroom. So, so you know, don't feel like you need to shop for college based on name. Feel like you should shop for it based on what's best for your kid and what's best for, for your family. Um, and, and stretching your family way too thin financially in, in pursuit of a goal from a specific college isn't necessarily a, a um, isn't necessarily the best choice for, for anyone. The other thing I think is really important to understand is every student is eligible for college scholarships. Yes. So you mentioned the, um, the scholarship that your daughter is applying to from, mm -hmm. um, from the insurance company. The scholarship landscape basically breaks down into three big groups. There is institutional financial aid, and that is um, scholarships and grants, as well as federal um, education programs that are designed to fill the gap between a family's ability to pay for college and the cost of college. There's a second, you know, the next group of scholarships is what's called institutional merit scholarships. And those are scholarships that colleges offer to attract the students that they want to enroll in their college. You know, we always think of that as being, you know, football and basketball players. But it's really the mathletes who clean up on that. And, and when I say mathletes, I mean relative to the population at the school as a whole. So my son, for example, had about a 3.5 GPA in high school, and he got a merit scholarship to the college that, mm -hmm. he, that he wanted to go to. So, you know, you don't have to be valedictorian to get a merit scholarship. You just have to look for colleges that are looking for students, um, for students like you. Then the third group of scholarships is the ones like, like you were talking about. Those are called outside scholarships, and they're offered by entities other than the college themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they, there are all, all manner of scholarships. There are many scholarships both outside scholarships and institutional scholarships, which mean they come from the colleges themselves, that are um, targeted for um, for students who've lost a parent. So, you know, so definitely be on the lookout for those. Um, make sure that the college knows that about your student as you as you are applying. And um, what do you mean, um, like let them know? Because um, one of so Haley's career counselor, whatever, told her she should write um, a letter to the college and let them know. Is that what you're talking about? Because they might offer more aid. Exactly, um, because it, it's it's something about her background that they should understand about her. Because chances are, that had an impact on her educational pathway, on her pathway through high school. It's mm -hmm. you know, it's it's normal that that you know, that has an impact on, on kids and, and it's mm -hmm. not unusual that kids struggle in school when they've lost a parent um, and that there are less resources in, in the household available as a result, um, as a result of that. So, you know, whether it's including it in your application essay, you know, incorporating that some, somewhere into, into your application essay, whether it's writing a separate letter to the college, you know, when you file the FAFSA, if you have not remarried, then your status on it is, you know, is is widowed, and so they'll see that in the financial aid office, but not necessarily in the admissions office. And it's, you know, it's something for you know for a kid who maybe lost their parent in high school and had a semester or more of of lower grades. That's certainly something that you want to make sure that the college understands True. why why that happened. Mm -hmm. So where. Where do you find, I mean, I've done it myself, um, we've spent hours looking, but do you have a specific like database or place that you find is the best for looking for scholarships? Yeah, so it's, you know, the unfortunate thing about our system is that it's um, not very, our education system is it's not very centralized, but I would say a couple of things. Your first stop um, should be the federal student aid website, which is studentaid.gov. Oh, right. 
on that website there's a tool called the student aid estimator and you can you can fill that out and it will give you an estimate of a number that's called your student aid index it used to be called your expected family contribution oh, that yeah. is the number that the federal methodology for financial aid which is what's used in a form called the FAFSA which is what you apply which is what you file to apply for financial aid that is the amount that they're calculating that you are able to pay for college Mm -hmm. and okay, and so if that number is lower than the cost of attending a college then you are eligible for financial aid on the basis of need if okay. that number is higher than the cost of attending college you are not eligible for financial aid on the basis of need and you need to look for colleges that offer merit scholarships so that's one tool i think that can be a good starting point just to see yeah um you know to to see what um what types of scholarships you should be you should be looking for a really great website for just finding out what kinds of financial aid colleges offer is college data okay. and that's just collegedata.com and you can enter a college name into their database and it pulls up a whole bunch of information one of the tabs is financials and under financials you can see um, number one, it shows what percentage of students who had financial need got a scholarship, and then what percent of their financial need was covered. So mm -hmm. you could be a student with a lot of financial need and not get a very big scholarship, um, mm -hmm. and, and then you're kind of stuck with the, with the difference there. So if you have high need, you don't want to apply to colleges that don't that don't meet a lot of need. It also on that on, you know on college data on the financials section it shows what percent of students who didn't have financial need got a merit scholarship. Hmm. So if merit scholarship is are what you're more likely to get, that's a really important number for you to see as well because that'll tell you, you know, is this a is this a college that's rewarding that's rewarding students um, students for merit and. And like I said before, most of those are just on the basis of, you know, of GPA and, and test scores. And then right. as you apply to colleges, so the good news is just applying to a college and filing the FAFSA is going to get you in the running for the vast majority of scholarships that the college mm -hmm. offers. Most of them are granted automatically, but it's always a good idea to check the college's website to see do they have additional scholarships that you need to apply for, and if so, you know, make sure, make sure that you're doing that as well. Mm -hmm. And then I know something that helped us is we looked for local scholarships, like within mm -hmm. the county, within the area. And like one of them, I had to nominate her and send in a letter from her teacher. And then she made it to the next round and now she has to fill out things and do an interview. Um, and then also on merit scholarships, no, not merit. This would not be called merit. It would be called, um, I don't know what you call it, but she got a choir scholarship. <laughs> so yeah. like the sports one, but it was for choir. So also look for other things besides just sports. Um, we were yeah. able to look through it and they had choir scholarships and theater scholarships and she went and tried out and she got it. And so those are some things to look for as well. My but we just started... got a scholarship for playing video games. <laughs> Seriously, I saw that on one of your book reviews and I was like, what is that? I actually read it to my husband. I'm like, scholarship for video games. So tell me more about that. We were so curious. Yeah, so, well, so esports is a big thing on college campuses. Oh yeah, right, yeah. Right now, and uh -huh. so my son played on an esports team. He had um, some of his some of his college friends were just during COVID. They were they were playing games online while they were sent home from from school. And when they went back to school, they decided to start an an esports program. That's and, awesome. Uh, and then they they ended up getting varsity status for it, and with that came came a scholarship. <laughs> Nice. Living this huge boy's dream. <laughs> yes, that's so awesome. Um, yeah. But you made a great point, Michelle, which is that the uh, the best place to look for for outside scholarships is close to home. You know, mm -hmm. there are big databases like the College Board that have loads and loads of scholarships. Those scholarships all have loads and loads of applicants. Yes. When you look locally, so within your community, at your high school's college and career center, you're going to find scholarships that are only open to people in your community or yes. at your high school. Like our high school had one that was for the tennis team. I mean, what are there, 10 people on the tennis team? Yeah. And one of them's getting that scholarship. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's good. Looking looking local, we found several. Um, 
ones in the area. I mean, we just sat for hours just like looking up things. And then she did go to some where you fill out one profile and then there's like a bunch that you can do. Um, mm -hmm. But any other uh, tips for scholarships? Yeah, well, you know, like, like you mentioned, you know, that college having a, a choir scholarship, lots of colleges have specific scholarships for specific demographics of students. You know, sometimes it's, you know, children of teachers or police officers right. or firefighters. Some of it's children who've lost a parent. Some, you know, so, so, so look for all those types of things at the colleges that you, that you are applying to and, uh, and make sure that you're checking, checking every, every box. Yeah, let's talk about, because there's probably other parents like me that did the FAFSA. Um, can you tell everybody, not like you're in charge of FAFSA, but like, why is it so late this year? What, what's going on with that? <laughs> yeah, so there was, um, so, so there was a, a big, big changes made to the FAFSA mm -hmm. this, this year. And it was supposed to come out last year, but it got delayed by another year. This was all part of... Um, it was the FAFSA Simplification Act that was like from from several several years ago, and you know one of the challenges with the FAFSA is that it is it collects so much information that it's a barrier to the students who most need access to financial mm. to financial aid because because of the complexity and um, and and so there was a, a big initiative to simplify it, you know, take it from 87 questions down to about 25, um, all of which should be, you know, should be beneficial. Um, but somewhere along the lines, the same education department that was doing that was also dealing with restarting student loan payments, with oh. debt cancellation, <laughs> with, with mm -hmm. everything else, and basically reworking their entire underlying system for calculating, um, for calculating eligibility for, for financial aid. And so it was delayed and delayed and delayed, and it continues to be delayed even after it's been delayed. So, so the law was that is that it has to be out by December 31st. And so it, the form mm -hmm. went online on December 31st. Um, I'm not sure that anyone actually was able to submit data no, to it. it. And then they said, mm -hmm. do it whenever, but we're not gonna send the data out to colleges until the end of January. That has now been pushed back till, um, till late March. The end result of that is that students are going to be getting their financial aid award letters very late in the decision-making process. Yes. Now, a number of colleges, so typically May 1st is what's called acceptance day, and that's when everyone right. has to say, you know, right. choose the college that they're going to go to. A lot of colleges have pushed their decision deadlines back. Mm -hmm. um, from May 1st to June 1st, just to give students adequate time to, to review and compare financial aid off award letters. It's really mm -hmm. important as you get these award letters that you do give them a high level of, of scrutiny because, you know, it can be like comparing apples to taco salad. It's, mm -hmm. you know, some will include student loans and work study. Some are only grants. Um, we found out, you know, with, with my kids, my, um, my son applied to two colleges, um, University of Oregon and University of Arizona. And when he got his financial aid awards, it looked like Arizona was about $7,000 a year more than Oregon. And he really wanted to go to Arizona. And we kind of said, we're not spending $7,000 yeah. extra dollars a year for you to have nice weather. <laughs> right. Um, you know, you, you figure this out. And, and it was interesting what he learned. So he learned, for example, that Arizona had used their highest cost housing and meal plan in their award oh. letter and Oregon had used the lowest. Uh -huh. And so if he put in where he was actually going to live, you know, that immediately knocked off about $4,500 of, wow. of the annual difference in in yeah. cost and you know as he went through more you know more and more layers of it it ended up that they basically both cost exactly the same mm -hmm. um so yeah. you know so do make sure that you look at that you look at things like that um when you when you are looking at your at your award letters you know are they grants or are they loans and work study because loans and work study those are your time and your money and, exactly <laughs> Um, grants are somebody else's money. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, yeah and, you know, and then look at the other costs that you're likely to incur. You know, if your student's interested in going out of state, what is your travel budget going to look like? You know, they're going to be going round trip probably three times a year. You're probably going to be going round trip a couple times a year, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's definitely something to consider. So uh, when I was on your website, I saw this master class about paying for college. Can you tell us a little bit about what you cover in that? Yeah, so my um, my master class is called the College Financial Plan, and it's um, and it's targeted at parents of high school students to really walk you through the process of um, finding colleges that are a fit for your student, you know, academically, socially, and financially. Um, finding out about finding scholarships, you know, figuring out, preparing to file the FAFSA, um, and it also includes things like talking to your kid about money because that's something that we don't really do a lot of these days. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and 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 giving your giving your student a really clear understanding of your college budget. Oftentimes, it feels like you're crushing their dreams, but what you're really doing is opening doors for them to have a great college experience that gives them a head start on life instead of that you know turns into an anchor that that weighs them down for their entire um, entire adulthood. So the course is various modules, like I said, um, you know, choosing colleges, researching them, figuring out what scholarships you're eligible for, finding additional scholarships. Um, um, having conversations about money, um, filing the FAFSA and the CSS profile if it's required, um, appealing financial aid awards. Um, so very few people oh. appeal their financial aid award. This is something that you are allowed to do. I didn't know about do. this. Okay. Um, and the vast majority of these appeals are successful. Oh, so, wow. so you can basically go back to the school and say, you know, we would we need more money to. To come here, and this is a process that um, that um, many students who've lost a parent will um, will go through. In particular, if um, so, the way that the FAFSA and the CSS profile work is they use your income from the prior year. So, right. so if if that parent were still alive, sophomore, junior year of high school, and then passed away. You know, you're using income data that's got two parents' income, where one parent isn't isn't there anymore. And so, mm -hmm. if that's your situation, you're going to have to appeal your financial aid award anyway. But right. you can always, um, you know, you can always ask for for more money. And my um, my online course has has a lot of um, tips for how you how you go about doing that. Wow, that's amazing. So that kind of brings me to another question. So. I believe this year's FAFSA is based off of 2022 taxes, mm -hmm. but so I wasn't married in 2022, but they said, if you're married now, we have to link. So Joel had to fill something out, even though, and I had to do it for his son, even though like he wasn't on my taxes, is that going to affect my award or my kid's award, even though it it's could, 22? Because the FAFSA is largely based on income. But he wasn't, I wasn't account. married to him in 22, which is what we're basing it off of. So this is what I'm really worried for my kids, that it's going to yeah. affect. I just wondered well, if you knew and, about that. <laughs> and yeah, and, and here's the thing. Every college gets to make their own decision about how they use that information. Okay. So, um, so some of them might say, yes, we are going to look at that information. You know, we are going to look at that and we're going to base our award on that, um, and others will say will say no that we're no we're not. I think in your situation, Michelle, what you'll want to do is go as you get financial aid awards, go back to the colleges and say, hey, you know, as you probably saw, my situation has changed. What is my aid package likely to look like in future years? Because mm -hmm. if you if this year's aid package is based on 2022 when you were a single parent. And you got a big financial aid award, and next year they're going to be counting two incomes, mm -hmm. and you would get a much lesser award. That's something that you want to know right now. Mm, that's a good point. Yeah, it's a really good point because I believe because we got married in twenty three, so when we come to this process the next year, it's going to for mm -hmm. sure affect it. And I don't, I don't want that to yeah affect their financial aid awards. But um, I actually didn't know yeah, what you're you explaining. Make sure that you get them onto a path 
that will work yeah. well for you. Right. And I didn't understand this, I guess, because with my son, so I've only been through it with him. Um, and I don't remember when I was in college, how it all worked. My parents helped me with all of it. So I didn't know that each school, like I thought it was like, this is the amount you're awarded no matter what school you're at. Like I didn't actually, there were two schools. He was no. looking at another school and the biggest difference was this was in state. And so it cost a lot less. So that's how he ended up going in Washington. Um, but I didn't realize that there's like power to change that. Like I had no idea. This is huge. <laughs> Yeah, so there's two there's two pieces of need based financial aid. Well, three. Um, one is federal funds, so that is Pell grants, work study, right. and student loans. Um, then the second piece is state grants. So mm -hmm. most states have have some form of state grant. And then the third piece is institutional dollars. Now the federal and state dollars are limited. You know, Pell grant is what, $7,000, $5,500 for a student loan, $3,500 for work study. So that's not gonna cover the cost of college. Many colleges step in with additional dollars of their own to fill oh. the rest of, of that gap. So the but numbers that you just do said- do that at their discretion. Right, the numbers you just said, those are like the max numbers? I didn't mm -hmm. know that there was this, can you say those again? <laughs> 75? So, so Pell Grant, and don't quote me on this, but it's around okay. $7,000. They The numbers went up this, they increased the okay. size of it um, this year, but with all the other dumpster fire of the thefts of this year. Um, um, and then um, the direct student loan, which is the loan that students can take out in their own name, the maximum first year loan is $5,500. They can borrow $6,500 oh, right. the second year and then $7,500 each of the last two years. Of, of college. And then work study is typically around $3,500. Okay. So, you know, that's about, okay. that's about $16,000, mm -hmm. which is of course not going to cover the full, the full cost of college. So then it's up to the college, whether they step in with additional funds of their own. Okay. So I know they've told us at Corbin that they have a Corbin grant that is based on need. So that's probably what, once they see the FAFSA, then they, they can exactly. give us that offer and that's the one that could change. Got exactly, it. yeah. You know, if we appeal it and all of that. Yeah, yep. Okay, okay, good information. I'm learning so much personally. I'm hoping this is helping other people too. I know it will. There are lots of other people in my situation. Um, any other points about college that you wanna make? Well, you know, to the point, it's it's available at lots of different prices, and the fact that you have financial need does not mean that every college is going to be generous with your student. So right. just make sure that you're looking for the colleges um, for the colleges that will be. Every college is required to have a tool on its website called a net price calculator. Oh, I've seen that. Yeah, and what that does is that lets you put your information in. Um, you know, your financial and sometimes academic information, and it will tell you what students like you pay to attend the college this year. Okay. And so it's certainly no guarantee that you're gonna get financial aid, but it will give you a pretty good picture of, of what the college's financial aid policies look, look like. And for example, when we were applying for colleges, my daughter applied to private, um, to private colleges, and we did the net price calculator for everything she was interested in, and we used them to rule out a lot of schools because a lot of schools said that they wouldn't that they wouldn't give her her any aid but the numbers we came that came back to us were everything from like eleven thousand to eighty two thousand dollars based on the same wow. the same <laughs> set of information uh -huh. wow <laughs> so, and... so and again it's to the point that the colleges have a lot of latitude about how they allocate their own their own dollars i would say too that for the colleges that she was accepted to, every financial aid package came within two thousand dollars of what the net price calculator had said. So, wow. so they were, you know, they were really helpful for us. They're slightly less helpful right now because they didn't have the new FAFSA formula when, mm -hmm. um, you know, to 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 make quotes. But that should be updated as time, you know, as as time goes on. Well, that's good. Well, definitely, um, we'll have a link to your masterclass and your website and all of that. So if people want to take the class to learn more, they can do that. Um, what would you say before we go? I'm just trying to think of another thing to kind of wrap it back up with widows. What would you say would be a good 
first step to a newly widowed, you know, widower, widower person who is feeling overwhelmed with finances? Like, I don't even know where to start. Like, I know that's kind of a big question, but like, let's say I came to you and I was like, I don't even know, like, what should I do? Like, yeah. So I think a great thing to do is look for a financial advisor who specializes in working with, with widows or widowers, um, Mm -hmm. who is a fiduciary, which means they're required to put your interests first. Okay. Um, because even if, you know, regardless of whether you want a long-term relationship with an advisor, a, a good advisor will educate you on the key areas of your financial life. So, you know, so what does your cash flow look like? How do you budget? How do you, um, you know, how do you allocate appropriate amounts to, to short-term and long-term savings? You know, how and where do you invest? What accounts should you be trying to save in once life stabilizes and cash flow stabilizes? You know, how do you manage your tax liability? (laughs) How do you, you know, if you're self-employed, how do you make quarterly payments? What's the right amount to have, you know, withheld from your paycheck? Um, It's all good stuff, yeah. How might you handle Social Security? You know, you and your kids might be eligible for it now if you have young kids at home, but then in the future when you retire, you want to have a Social Security benefit available available to you as as well so you know a good fi- and then you know how do you update your your wills your beneficiaries you know all of those things now that someone now that someone has passed away and I do think this is a great area to get financial help in it's the kind of help that pays that will pay for itself um, yeah. over time yeah. just due to your higher level of understanding of, yeah. of the things yeah. that, that you need to be to be cognizant of no, that's really good advice. I've never had a financial advisor. I've had a fr- I've heard friends talk about it something. They'll say my financial advisor, my financial planner, but I didn't really know until you just explained like <laughs> what it is you do. It's basically like I would come to you with all my finances and you would help me figure out a plan. Is that mm-hmm. in a nutshell yeah. what it is? Yeah, and you know, and so for us, you know, when we work with when we work with a widow, we we start by just, you know, because because your day-to-day money picture has changed. We start by looking at what is your budget? You know, what are your fixed expenses? What are your discretionary expenses? What is your income? You know, what is the gap that needs to be filled now because mm-hmm. because you've lost an income and, and maybe there wasn't life insurance or maybe there was, but you mm-hmm. need to be drawing from it reasonably <laughs> um, right. and prudently to, you know, to make it last. Um, you know, and then and then, how should you be saving on an ongoing on an ongoing basis? Um, what are you know What are the the things to look out for? Um, yeah. As you as as you go through as you go through life. Those are all really amazing things. Well, I really appreciate you coming here today. I know I learned personally. I learned so many things that I'm excited about in so many different areas that I'm going to apply. So thank you for that. And I know our audience too. Um, so really quick, we'll have links, but sometimes people don't always like look at the links. What is your website if they're just hearing it? Like, is it something easy to remember? I know I looked it up. Yeah. But... So my website is howtopayforcollege.com. <laughs> there we go. We can remember that howtopayforcollege.com. We'll have a link too, but you guys, even if you're driving, you can remember that. <laughs> um, that's a great place to find you. And also, isn't that what the book is called? How to pay for college? That is what the book is called. Yes. How right? to pay and for I... college. And I saw that on Amazon. Do you have it other places as well? Um, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, um, Bookshop.org. Nice. Um, has it? So, so it's okay. It's in the the usual places. Yeah, the usual places you find books. You can always so. ask your local bookshop to get it. <laughs> yeah, that's always a great thing. So, anyways, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate you and. Um, I'm hoping people will also be as excited as I am and check out your website and check out your book. So thanks so much, Anne, and I hope you have a great day. Bye. Thank you for having me.